Is God the author of confusion this evening? God is not the author of confusion. Do you know that as we study the Bible, we can come into harmony not upon what we think, but upon what is truth? That is the discovery that we want this evening. What is truth? The very fact that Satan has counterfeit prophets in these last days should tell you what? That there is genuine prophecy to be considered. There is genuine uh, truth that demands our attention at this time. Does a man counterfeit something if there isn't a reality? That man would be wasting his time. If I were to give you, Sister Ashley, a counterfeit dollar bill, knowing there was no such thing as a genuine dollar bill, would you ever use it? So then my deception is without purpose. The only reason why Satan has brought false prophets in these last days is because God's plan all along was to have a people who have what the Bible calls the spirit of prophecy. Revelation chapter 12. Let's turn in our Bibles. We want to see from the word of God and not from Brother Paul, amen, that prophecy plays an essential part in victory in this great controversy. In the book of Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7, are we there? Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7, the Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 17, beloved. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make what? War with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there was war in heaven, amen? That war was tremendously and embarrassingly lost by the devil. Praise God. The devil was cast out of heaven, the Bible says, and he came to this earth. Is that where we live? So then guess what? This evening we are at war. Now the Bible says that Satan understands his enemy. Satan is not at war with just any people on earth. The Bible says he is at war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. By show of hands, from your Bible alone, is there anyone in this room who knows what the testimony of Jesus Christ is? If I were to say that the testimony of Jesus Christ is that God is good, would that be wrong? Did the life of Christ testify that God is good? Yes, it did. But is that what the Bible is talking about here? If I were to say from this pulpit that the testimony of Jesus Christ is that God is love, would that be wrong? Did the life of Christ testify that God is love? But is that what the text is talking about? It's important that we understand this, beloved. Because the Bible says that Satan is at war with those who keep the commandments and have this thing called the testimony of Jesus. Do you want to know from your Bible what that is? Do you care about that? Do you want to know? Revelation chapter 19. Turn there with me. Revelation chapter 19. I'm thankful for this holy book. The fact that we can be shown things that we question and God gives us answers from the word of God. Not from opinion, but from the Bible. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, the Bible says, speaking of John, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See that thou doest it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. What did they have? The testimony of Jesus. Follow the text. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of 
prophecy. Amen? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 told us that Satan is specifically at war with the people that keep the commandments of God and that have what the Bible calls the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus, beloved? We just read it from Revelation 19 and verse 10. The spirit of prophecy. In other words, God has a people that he has given a vision. For where there is no vision, guess what? The people perish. God has a people on earth that he has given the prophetic gift. He has a people on planet earth that he has blessed with the spirit of prophecy, which is not the testimony of some man or of some woman or of anybody else. It is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do we care what Jesus has to say on prophecy? Do you know why I believe you? Because we wouldn't be gathered in a meeting called Jesus on Prophecy unless we cared what Jesus had to say on the subject. Amen? What does Jesus have to say about prophecy? In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, the Bible says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them that thou by the prophecies, that is, mightest war a good warfare. Do you know that it is impossible for us to war a good warfare against the dragon in this generation unless we have an accurate understanding of what Jesus has said concerning prophecy? The Bible says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning their faith, have made shipwreck. In the book of Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14, the Bible says, speaking of prophecy, where no counsel is, the people do what? Fall. Now follow me, beloved, because I want you to see that every night's study has been woven together, and it's going to continue to be that way until the end of this series. We saw that God is preparing a people not to fall, but to do what? Stand. Now, if the Bible says where no counsel is, the people fall, then in order to prepare a people to stand, God would have to restore his counsel. Isn't that right? Because where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the book of Hosea, speaking of Moses, the Bible said, And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel where? Out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. Does anyone in here know what the word preserve means? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ignoring what you're saying. I'm, I'm soaking it in. Amen? How many of you in this room bake bread or have ever baked bread before? Take their numbers down, Sister Ashley. Yes, we're going to have to get together. When you bake bread, does bread have a shelf life? What that simply means is that if we do not preserve the bread, it's only a matter of time until it what? Spoils. And that's not good bread, is it? The purpose of a preservative is to keep something from spoiling. Amen? Amen? The Bible says in relation to Moses and the people of Egypt that by a prophet, God preserved his people. Now, if you were the devil, think about it, beloved, and you wanted to spoil the people of God, what would you attack? The Bible says that the prophet is the way that God uses to preserve a people. So if you want to spoil a people, you have to take away the preservative. Isn't that right? Do you know that there are many of us in our Christian experience today that are walking not upright before God, but spoiled, thinking we're all right when we're all wrong, and the reality is, if God wants to fix us, he has to get us to understand the gift that he gave us in these last days. He has to get us back to a place where we understand the times in which we live. Do you know everything we do is regulated by time? If it's 9 a.m. in the morning and Sister Ashley and Brother Paul show up at your house looking for dinner, what would you say? 
You're too early, Brother Paul. Sister Ashley, your husband must be out of his mind. Do you see what time it is? It's too early for that. There is a time for everything under the sun, a time and a season for every purpose under the sun. Everything humanity does is regulated by time. In the same way, beloved, God wants us to understand the time in which we live so that he can preserve a people, prepare a people to stand and return, not for a spoiled harvest, mm -mm, but a harvest that has been completely ripened in the mature characteristics of Christianity. 2 Peter chapter 1, I want us to see something. What is our attitude towards prophecy? We're going to 2 Peter chapter 1 in our Bibles. I want us to see from the Word of God that there is a specific way that we ought to view prophecy in these last days. Are you turning with me? I heard, mm-hmm. Praise God. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 19. Or we'll start at verse 16. The Bible says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says that the disciples were eyewitnesses. They weren't believing something that someone made up. They actually saw it. Amen? How many of you physically saw Jesus? Not one. How many of you believe that Jesus is in fact real? Follow on in the text. The Bible says something very special concerning you and I. It says, For we received from God the Father honor, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also... So the, 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 the disciple Peter is saying, in addition to the fact that we're eyewitnesses, we actually saw Jesus. He says, in addition to that, we actually heard God speak from heaven. We heard what he said. But he says, in addition to that, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Do you know the Bible says, well, I hope you know, because we just read it, that prophecy, beloved, is more sure than an eyewitness account? Prophecy is more sure than an eyewitness account. Now, somebody may be asking themselves, how can that be? If a man sees it happen then I think he has more credential to speak on it than a man who believes but hasn't seen it. The Bible says that prophecy is a more sure account than even someone who saw it with their very eyes. I'll tell you why. What we're about to get to see in a few moments, no one man could live to see all in his own lifetime. No one man could live to see all that we're about to say in his lifetime unless he was touched by the spirit of prophecy. And this is the reason why the Bible says that prophecy is a more sure word. When we study this thing, beloved, you're going to see from the Bible that there are things we learned in history class that the Bible spoke about before the history teacher ever studied the subject. Do you believe that the Bible is a perfect textbook? Is there mathematics in there? My Bible said unto 2003, let, let, let me not run ahead. Do you believe that there is science in there, beloved? Genesis opens our eyes to nature and all these things, the star, all of those things are there. History is in the Bible and we're going to see this thing. What is our attitude towards prophecy? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, but do what? Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. It is better for us to prove what we believe than to simply despise people for not agreeing with us. If someone believes one thing concerning prophecy, I told you that there are many different views in these denominations in the world today, didn't I? 
If someone else believes one way, rather than being at war with them, I would rather sit in front of the word of God and discover what is truth. Prove all things, the Bible says. Hold fast to that which is good. Now, if the Bible says to hold fast, hold on to that which is good, what do we do with that which is not good? Let it go. Beloved, if Jesus shows me anything from the word of God, I cling to that thing and I hold on to it for dear life. And what he shows me is not in his word. You know what I do with that thing? I let it go. I believe that I can trust him as he leads all the way. The subject for this evening is the book of Daniel. What book, beloved? And I want you to know that the book of Daniel is a book for our time. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even unto the time of the end. Pause there for a moment. There are many today who don't talk about the book of Daniel because they believe that Daniel is a sealed book. Did the Bible say Daniel would be sealed? Did the Bible give you the duration of the time for which Daniel would be sealed? It said, even unto the time of the end. In other words, if you are living in the prophet Daniel's day, Daniel would share this prophecy with you, but do you know that at that time you wouldn't necessarily understand what he was talking about? Because Daniel was seeing years and years and years into the future kingdoms that had not yet existed, kings that had not yet come to power, governments that had not yet come to war. Daniel had no idea. He had a friend named Gabriel, you'll see in the book of Daniel chapter 9, who had to explain these things to him. But the Bible says if you're living in the time of the end, do you believe that's where you are? Then the things that were sealed to the understanding of Daniel and people living in his day, they're not sealed to you and I. God is not seeking to keep it in a mystery, beloved. He's seeking to reveal. He's seeking to do what? Reveal. The Bible says, shut up the words and seal the book even unto the time of the end. Many shall, ro shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And I heard, but I understood not. Do you see what I'm saying? Daniel is hearing what the, what the angel is saying, but he does not understand, because the understanding of what he's hearing is for the generation that live in the time of the end. Is it clear? I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up, and they are sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white, and they shall be tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise, the who, beloved? The wise shall understand. God has prophesied that the prophecies here in the book of Daniel would never be understood by the wicked in the final days. But he has a separate group of people that he has called the wise. What does he call them? Who are the wise, beloved? Let's go on our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9. I want to make sure that I'm among the wise so that I can understand what we're talking about this evening. How about you? In the book of Proverbs chapter 9, we're asking the question to the word of God, who are the wise? For only they shall understand what we're about to get into. Proverbs chapter 9, beginning at verse 10. Say amen when you're with me. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, say amen. The Bible says, the fear of of the Lord. The what, beloved? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. God told Daniel that no one would understand the prophecies in this book except for the wise. Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So then who are the wise, beloved? They that fear the Lord. Do you remember a couple of nights ago, we talked about Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. The first angel, the second angel, and the third angel's message. Is that right? The first angel said something very interesting. He said, fear God and give him glory. Did the first angel say that? 
if the only people in the last days that can understand prophecy are the wise, but the wise are those who have the fear of God, then I submit to you, beloved, that in order to be among the wise, you and I would have to have a knowledge of the first, the second, and guess what else? The third angel's message. Is it making sense? Is it coming together for you? Is it coming together? All right. But what about the book of Revelation? Did you know that Revelation is an unfolding, an unsealing, really a magnification and a clarification of the prophecies contained in the book of Daniel? It is impossible for a man to understand what was sealed in Daniel unless he sees the balance with what is revealed in guess what book? Revelation. And Revelation is, guess what? A book for our time. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the revelation of beasts which God gave unto him. You see, Lord, I knew they were sleeping because I read the text and not one person stopped me. What does the Bible say? It says the revelation of... Do you know that it is possible to open the book of Revelation and leave with more understanding of beasts and of plagues and of judgments than it is to have a revelation of Jesus? But the entire purpose of the book is not to, to promote fear, beloved, but confidence in the man, Christ Jesus. I believe that God holds the future. There's a song. It says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living because he lives. Beloved, the fact that Jesus holds the future is wonderful news to me. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ again? It is the spirit of of prophecy. And of all the things that he saw, Revelation says, blessed is he that readeth. Let no man tell you that there is a curse or that Revelation is taboo. Jesus says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The Bible showed us God's prophetic order. God gave the revelation to Christ to show to his servants the future. Christ sent it by his angel in symbols and signs to show to his servants. The angel gives it to the prophet who is God's servant and the prophet records the testimony of Jesus which is the spirit of prophecy. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do how much? Nothing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Did you know that before God does anything, his intention is to let you and I know? Do you believe Jesus is getting ready to come? Do you think Jesus is going to come before he has a discussion with us about what he's getting ready to do? Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he first reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Beloved, I cannot but share these things with you this evening. The Bible says that prophecy was given to us as a love gift. What type of gift? A love gift. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 4, speaking of Christ, that when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, among which were apostles and some prophets for the perfecting of the saints. In order to perfect a people, in order to prepare a people to stand and to keep them from falling, God saw in his infinite wisdom the need of the love gift of prophecy. Now Daniel was told in Daniel chapter 9, 
Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly how? Swiftly. Touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication or prayer, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, because thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, because you are greatly beloved, understand the matter and consider the vision. Why do we study prophecy? Because Jesus loves us. Why do we care what God has to say about the future? Why has he revealed it? Because Jesus loves us. There are many in the churches today who feel that rather than talking about prophecy, we should only talk about the love of Jesus. But the same Bible that we believe in tells us that prophecy is a revelation of the love of Jesus. They go together, beloved. They go together. And the way that we treat the gift reveals our thoughts of the giver. Daniel chapter 2, a most important chapter in your Bible. Are we turning there? Daniel chapter 2, a most important chapter in your Bible. In order to understand where we are in earth's history, we have to understand the procession of the kingdoms as outlined in the book of Daniel chapter 2. We're turning to Daniel chapter 2, amen? When you're with me, say amen again. Praise the Lord. Beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Does anybody know who Nebuchadnezzar was? Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon who took Israel captive. Isn't that right? Nebuchadnezzar has all of Israel in captivity. He is the king of Babylon at this time. In verse 2, it says, Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers. I might even add the, 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 the horoscope people. All of those people were there, beloved. And the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. And so they came and stood before the king. Follow the story. Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. He was a heathen king. What type of king? Heathen king. Do you know some of us think that God can't speak to the heathen in our world today? That God only speaks to Christian people today. Does God desire to save those who don't believe? Is there any measure to which God would not go to reach those souls? Here is an evidence that God would do everything in his power to reach those who don't believe. Nebuchadnezzar is a heathen king, and yet he is dreaming dreams from God. In verse 3, the Bible says, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit, my mind, was troubled to know the dream. Have you ever had a dream that you were so impressed with? But when you woke up to tell your significant other, or to tell your children, or to tell your best friend, you can't remember what it was that you dreamed? Have you ever experienced that? I had that experience just recently. I had, I had a, uh, I, I still can't remember the dream, but the point is, I had a dream that was so impressive on my mind that I'm sitting here and I said, I can't wait to tell Ashley. Ashley was asleep, so I waited. But by the time she woke up, I had forgotten everything that I dreamed. In such a situation, we find King Nebuchadnezzar in verse four, then spoke the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now somebody says, Brother Paul, this king is out of his mind. Something is wrong with this man. King Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep and had a dream, amen? When he woke up, the dream he could not remember. So he calls all of the wise men in Babylon to his bedchamber, and he commands them not only to interpret the dream, Sister Ashley, but to actually tell him the dream that he forgot. Is that strange? 
Now somebody says, that's impossible. I say with God, all things are possible. But you see, the issue that we find here in Daniel chapter 2 is these wise men by profession. If I asked a surgeon to take care of me during surgery, is that uh, preposterous? It makes sense. That's his profession. Amen? If I ask a lawyer to assist me in some legal matter, is that preposterous? It makes sense according to their profession. Do you know that the wise men of Babylon, by their profession, were men who had an understanding of things concerning God and had the ability to make known unto the king what those things were? I want us to understand the backdrop because otherwise you'll think King Nebuchadnezzar was just crazy, asking people to remember what he himself didn't remember. No. The king was asking them to do that because the profession that they had, their job title, was that specific thing that the king was asking. Is it making sense? Let's follow on. Let's see what these, uh, these wise men said. In verse 6, King Nebuchadnezzar says, But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see that the dream is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. So Nebuchadnezzar is awakening to what's going on with these wise men. You told me by your profession that you know God and you're able to interpret dreams and stars and your horoscopes will tell you all of these things. That's what you said. But now that I'm asking you to do exactly what your job says you can do, you're trying to, 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 to procrastinate and to gain time because you know you don't have the ability. Back home, I have friends who tell me all the time, Brother Paul, the reason why you think about the Bible the way you do is because you're a Capricorn. I say no. The reason why I think about the Bible the way that I do is because God loves me. And as I see the love for Jesus, it draws me right here to his word. And here I am seeing these same people with the same sciences failing their king. In verse 10, the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon this earth that can show the king this matter. Therefore, there is no king, there is no lord or ruler that has ever asked such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. So they're saying the problem is not us, the problem is you. King Nebuchadnezzar, there has never been a king that has asked an astrologer to do what you're asking him to do. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other that can show it before the king except who? Now wait a second. I want you to catch what's in your Bible. They said to the king, there is no one that can show you what you're asking except who? The gods. But I thought by their profession, Sister Mary, these were men who had a connection with the gods. Now they're telling the king out of their own mouth, we don't know these gods that we're talking about. You need someone who has a connection. You need someone who has a close, intimate personal relationship with God in order to get the answer that you're looking for. And we, the men of Babylon, we, the wise people of Babylon, are not those guys. How do you think that made the king feel? They were on his payroll, sister. How do you think that made the king feel? Follow on. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Verse 14, things get better, beloved. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, 
which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon, he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known unto Daniel. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him what? Time. And that he would show the king the interpretation. Now what's interesting here, in Daniel chapter 1, do you know that Daniel, this is not his first run-in with King Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel had a run-in with King Nebuchadnezzar before this instance here in Daniel chapter 2. There was an issue on health. There was an issue on what? Now you may not be hearing what I'm telling you. There was an issue on health in Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 1 concerning the type of food that the people were eating in Babylon. And Daniel made a suggestion to the captain's guards at that time, and he said, give us a plant-based diet. The Bible calls it pulse, but I don't want you to think of this, so I'm, I'm going to say plant-based diet. Give us a vegetarian diet. Rather than the, the, the pork of Babylon and the meat of Babylon and all these things that the king thinks is going to make us wise and strong, give us our vegetarian diet. Do you know that the king tried Daniel and his friends for 10 days? And after 10 days, it was seen by contrast that the diet that God had given to his people was able to make them stronger wiser, better, ten times than all of the magicians and the wise men in Babylon. Now it's interesting, King Nebuchadnezzar, when the Chaldeans came to him, said, I'm going to kill you because you're trying to get time. But when Daniel came and requested time, the king gave him exactly what he asked for because there was already evidence in the life of Daniel that Daniel was not pretending to have a relationship with God. Amen? Continuing. In verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known unto Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Think about that, beloved. King Nebuchadnezzar says, tell me what I dreamed. Tell me the interpretation. Daniel goes to God one time. How many times? Well, the Bible says it was in that night. He may have prayed many times, amen? But he went to God in that one night. And when Daniel asked of God, the very thing that the wise men of Babylon could not make known, God revealed to his servant the prophet. Verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings, and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Jump down with me to verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said this unto him, I have found a man. Do you remember the words of the, the wise men of Babylon? There is not a man. Now the king's guard is saying, there is a man, beloved, in contrast, of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Now I want you to jump to verse 31. We're going to get into the dream that, Babylon, uh, that Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar, had. Verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. A what? A great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms were of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, 
the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Is that a lot? Do you suppose you understand why he forgot? Is that a lot to dream, beloved? The Bible says that God not only gave Daniel the dream, he gave him the interpretation. He gave him the what? Verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation. I love the confidence that we get from the word of God, beloved. We ought not to guess at anything. The Bible says, we will tell you the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven have been given into thine hand and have made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. What was the head of gold, beloved? Nebuchadnezzar was represented by this head of gold. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of what kingdom? Babylon. So when we're talking about the head of gold in Bible, in Bible prophecy, we are talking about the kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of Babylon. And after you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? Divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now many of us are saying to ourselves, Brother Paul, I did not come here to go through the table of the elements. Gold and iron and brass and silver. What do these things mean? According to your Bible, the head of gold in the image represented who? Well, yes, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of? So the head of gold represents Babylon. Daniel told the king that after he ruled, has Nebuchadnezzar died? Nebuchadnezzar died many years ago, many, many years ago. But do you know that after Nebuchadnezzar died, another kingdom came up in his place? In the same way that Babylon is fallen and something else has gone in its place. In the book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet, we're coming to a close. On page 13, we're told, although Daniel lived 2,500 years ago, he is a latter-day prophet. His character should be studied for its development reveals the secret of God's preparation of those who will welcome Christ at his appearing. His prophecies should be understood, for in them is the key. The what, beloved? The key which unlocks history until the end of time. The Savior himself bore witness to this fact when the disciples asked, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He said, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoso readeth, let him do what? Understand. In this, we have the divine permission to read and understand the prophecies of Daniel. These prophecies are intended, therefore, to warn a people of the coming of Christ in one night. How many nights, beloved? In one night, God revealed the history of over 2,500 years. And what the human historian requires volumes to explain is given in only 15 verses. The scriptures explain themselves. 
and in divine records every word is well chosen and put in the proper setting. In the image revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, the glory of the Babylonian kingdom is recognized by the Lord and represented by the head of gold. Did you see that from your Bible? But while giving due credit to the present state of things, the spirit of prophecy with equal candor points out to the self-exalted king the weakness of the institutions in which he has placed his trust and the inability of the Babylonian learning to save him and to save them from impending destruction. Does the Bible confirm this to be true? I like this picture. I like this picture very much, beloved. God is able to take 15 verses in the Bible and lay out the history of kingdoms until the end of time. Do we live in the last days? Do you think God foresaw that? Is there, plan, is, is there a plan for you and I in these last days? I want you to pay close attention. Everything that I'm about to show you from the Bible is in the handout for tonight. I suppose we ought to get the handout, amen? Beloved, listen. Jesus has laid it out in only 15 verses. Here we go. Are you ready? The succession of kingdoms according to Daniel chapter 2. From 605 B.C. until 539 B.C., the Bible represented the kingdom of Babylon as the head of gold. Is that in your Bibles? But the Bible said in Daniel chapter 2 that after Nebuchadnezzar died and after Babylon was fallen, there would be a kingdom that came in that was inferior to his. Is that not so? Which is more expensive, gold or silver? Gold. Gold, amen. So then what we're seeing in the statue is as time unfolds, the worth of the kingdom, or rather the, the wealth of the kingdom, is deteriorating. We went from a kingdom of gold to a kingdom of silver to a, listen, that looks like a penny, does it not? To a kingdom of copper, to a kingdom of iron, down to kingdoms of uh, iron trying to mingle with miry clay. The Bible is saying that the succession of kingdoms, it doesn't get better and better in this world. It gets what? Worse and worse. Are we following? The Bible speaks of Medo-Persia, which took the place of Babylon 539 B.C. until 331 B.C. Somebody says, how do we know that from the Bible? Do you remember in the book of Daniel chapter 5? There was a king by the name of Belshazzar. What was his name? But the lessons that Nebuchadnezzar had learned, which led him to glorify the God of heaven, Belshazzar had not learned. And so what Belshazzar did was Belshazzar took the holy cups from out of the sanctuary, from the captivity of Israel, and he began to drink wine. He began to do what? Drink wine from out of those cups. In the book of Revelation chapter 17, the Bible speaks of a people that are drunk with the wine of Babylonian fornication. fornication. Is that five minutes? Praise the Lord, five minutes. Can I take five minutes? All right. There are parallels all throughout the Word of God. In the same way, the Bible said in Daniel chapter 5, in the book of Daniel chapter 5, the Bible says that while Babylon was carrying on, partying and reveling and drinking and being merry, that outside of the city there was a king by the name of Cyrus. What was his name? And Cyrus had besieged Babylon. Now, it's interesting. If you're surrounded by your enemy, beloved, why on earth would you be having a party at that time? Do you suppose that the Babylonian king, Belshazzar, was so confident in the Babylonian city that he thought, no matter how many armies are outside, we will stand? Listen, when the Bible says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, there is nothing Babylon can do to stand against the power of that word. What do you say? The Bible says in that very feast, Daniel chapter 5, a bloodless hand came into the meeting and wrote something upon the wall. And this is the writing that was written, Mine, Mine, Tekel, U Pharisee. And this is the interpretation of the thing, Mine. God hath numbered thy kingdom and hath done what? Finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to who? 
the Medes, and the Persians. And in that very night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. The Bible shows us in no uncertain words that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, was killed by the king of the Medes and Persians, Darius. So then after Babylon, what kingdom is there? I heard Greece. Well, not, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. If the king of Persia, if the king of the Medes and Persians defeated the Babylonian king, then the Medes and Persians are the next kingdom in the prophecy. Does it make sense? So then the breastplate of silver and the arms of silver represented the kingdom of Medo-Persia. History tells us they ruled from 539 until 331 B.C. But the Bible said that after the Medes and Persians, there would come another kingdom. This kingdom was symbolized by the brass in that image. And that kingdom is Greece. Have you ever heard of a king by the name of Alexander the Great? Now, beloved, I, listen, I wish we had more time. Did you know that the Bible talks about history? <laughs> Have you ever heard of a king by the name of Alexander the Great? Did you know the Bible heard of that king too? In fact, did you know that the Bible spoke about that king before that king was born? Daniel said that there would be a kingdom of brass that would defeat the Medes and the Persians. Beloved, Alexander the Great defeated King Darius III of Persia in what history has called the Battle of Guagam uh, Guagamela, 331 BC or Arbella. Alexander was that king of that other empire that defeated the Medes and the Persians, guess what, right on time. Daniel saw all of this. Now question, did Daniel the prophet ever meet Alexander the Great? No, beloved. This is why the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. It is more sure than an eyewitness account because no man lives to see all of it take place. We must rest on the promise of God. It is he that sees, it is he that orchestrates. It is he that sets up kings, it is he that lays them down. And as we're watching the prophecy unfold, the only person who gets any of the glory is Jesus Christ. Alexander the Great defeated King Darius III of Persia, and thus the prophecy was fulfilled that another kingdom represented by brass would overcome the Medes and the Persians. Now, interesting fact about Alexander the Great. Did you know history will tell you that Alexander the Great never killed King Darius III? While he defeated King Darius' army, the Persian army, Alexander was not the one who killed the king. Do you know how that happened? King Darius III was surrounded by people he could not trust. And when his army was defeated at the Battle of Gogam... Uh, how do you say that, Lord? Gogamela. Say that with me. Praise God. When Darius was defeated at the Battle of Gogamela, he took off with these same men that were surrounding him, thinking that he could rally the troops and give one last uh, hurrah, is what they say, in order to come back against Alexander the Great. But history will tell you, when Alexander recognized that Darius was fleeing, guess what he did? He pursued him. And when the men that surrounded King Darius recognized that Alexander was on their tail, they thought that they would offer a ransom to save their own lives. History says that Alexander the Great was right on their tails, and when they recognized that the king was there, they killed Darius and left him there naked and bleeding in that cart. His own servants, his own friends. Now, if you study history, the Bible, uh, the Bible does confirm this, but history will tell you that a similar thing happened to an emperor by the name of Caesar. Beloved, we have to be careful who we trust. I trust Jesus. What do you say? Darius was killed and found in his court, and history tells you that when Alexander the Great found this Persian king dead, rather than, than, than spitting on his corpse or disrespecting him, Alexander wept. He carried the body of King Darius back to Babylon, which was now his kingdom, because he was now the king. And he gave him and he paid for all of the funeral expenses. Darius, his enemy, was buried as a friend. Now that's interesting, because these are heathen kings, beloved, that are demonstrating characteristics of a loving God in heaven. Now I told you, Alexander, though he conquered the world, he could not conquer self. God wants us to give us the victory in both uh, departments. 
Now, is Greece the last... Let me cut off these legs here. Is Greece the last kingdom in the secession? The Bible says that after Greece, there would come a kingdom represented as the strength of iron that would dominate the entire world. Does anyone know historically... All these open book tests. Does anybody know historically what kingdom it was that conquered Greece? The Roman Empire. The Iron Roman Empire. In 168 to 476 AD, Rome came on the scene. All of these kingdoms, beloved, represent universal dominion. What type of dominion? Universal dominion. And you'll study the history. Every single one of these kingdoms persecuted the people of God. Every single one. Pagan Rome. I'm going to skip right past that. The Bible said that after pagan Rome, the kingdoms would be divided. Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 to 42. It said the kingdoms would be divided until the end of time. What that simply means is after pagan Rome, we should not be looking for a universal dominion of any specific empire. But every single continent, every single kingdom would be divided. Do you know that Satan is working even now to bring what many people call a new world order? Do you know what that is? By the grace of God, by the end of the series, you're going to know exactly what that is, beloved, because I believe that at the same time, Jesus is getting ready to come and receive a people who are a part of his kingdom. Now, I'm going to close right here. In Daniel 2, verses 43, the Bible spoke about how the iron that represented Rome would be mingled with something called miry clay. Do you know that in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6, the Bible refers to God's people as the clay? The Bible says that God is the potter and we are the clay. So if you were to take the iron of Rome and mingle it with the clay that represents God's people, what you're getting is a joining of church and state. Now, you may not understand the significance of what I'm talking about right now, but if we're back here tomorrow evening, we're going to get even more of this. Beloved, were you blessed? Amen. Beloved, do you see your need to study prophecy much more? Is this something that we can get in one night? Well, Daniel got it in one night. We need to take time to study. What do you say? And I'm thankful to be here to study with you. We're going we're gonna to close right here with a word of prayer. Beloved, I believe that we can trust Jesus with the future. If there's any that believe that, I just ask that you raise your hand with me. The same God that revealed it to Daniel is the same God that can keep us in the end of time. 